Wisconsin University. Chris is also the recipient of the Rutherford Scholarship and is a member of the Golden Key International Honor Society. So please join me in welcoming Chris. Photo, like the photograph of an abandoned nursing home 
tagged with the spray-painted slogan, God has left Detroit. Moore leans on the compositional tactic of ironic juxtaposition, no old standby of documentary city photography. In another photograph repeated in Marchand and Meffer's collection of the East Grand Boulevard Methodist Church, its biblical invocation, and you shall say that God did it, looms above its sanctuary. The irony is obvious, heavy-handedly so, yet the photographer's meaning is less clear. One feels obliged to raise the obvious defense of the Almighty. If anyone or anything did it, General Motors and Detroit City Council had a hell of a lot more to do with it than God did. <laughs> and who said God was ever here in the first place? This compositional inclusion of the phrase involving God is meant, is meant to be startling and it succeeds, but is neither truthful of the present, past, present, or future. It is nothing more than ruined form, a term circulating the photographic community. Leary says that all the elements are here, the exuberant connoisseurship of dereliction, the unembarrassed re rejoicing of, at the excitement of it all, hastily balanced by the liberal posturing of the sympathy of a man-made Katrina, and most importantly, the absence of people. The photo on the cover of uh, The Ruins of Detroit is an interesting choice, which to me represents the great, greater body of work. It is the Mi Michigan Central Station, the most famous ruin in Detroit. The photo is framed so to avoid any context of place. It could be anywhere in the world, it is a photograph of an object, not a photograph of a social, political, or economic situation, for which this room is integrally linked. This is part of the reason why the image exploits the misery of Detroit without presenting a discussion for solutions. It turns the city into an object. It seems as if photographs of Detroit's ruins are distracting views from the present, instead substituting false prophecies for the future. This is an unfortunate misstep, since the abandoned spaces of Detroit still resonate with the slow social and economic recovery of the city and nation. This fascination with Detroit's post-apocalyptic landscape could stem from our growing cultural fear of the end of the world. This visual nature of Detroit's ruins embodies our worst fears for the future. We are poisoning our planet and seeing the catastrophic results. Technology is decomposing traditional social interaction, and the dragging on of a global financial crisis is leaving little room for future hope. In an attempt to understand the grim future, we are becoming fascinated with the apocalypse. We have the Y2K, the end of the Mayan calendar, by the increased popularization of zombies in media. Detroit may seem like the perfect, real abandoned lab landscape, and yet it is not abandoned. There are people who still live and work in Detroit who want to be seen for their unique, creative, unique creativity and success, rather than pigeonholed and exploited for their ruins. Photography aside, uh, Detroit's ruins still hold potential for the successful interpretation of time. Various projects are underway that have been inspired by reflecting on the meaning of the Detroit ruins. The Roosevelt, Mas Roosevelt Park Master Plan, for example, is the result of community members banding together to preserve a piece of their local history. Leading the charge is Phil Cooley, a young local entrepreneur who is interested in the cultural re revitalization of Detroit. Conceived in 2008 with Tad Heidenkin and Urban Detail, Roosevelt Park is situated in front of the Michigan Central Station. The station was originally built in 1913 by the two architectural firms, Reed and Stem, as well as Warren and Wetmore, the same architects who designed Grand Central Station in New York City. Michigan Central Station, however, has been abandoned and left to decay <coughs> since closing in 1988. The Roosevelt Park Master Plan does not physically change the building, but instead creates a plaza in front. The plaza projects the geometries of the station onto the horizontal plane. The design features will act as a memorial should anything ever happen to the station. The plaza itself will contain an amphitheater and skate park while using Michigan Central Station as a backdrop. The master plan will be implemented via a series of small to medium scale interventions. This is an attempt at reclaiming community space while encouraging something, be it preservation, restoration, uh, etc., to happen to the Michigan Central Station in order to avoid demolition. Uh, while many of uh, Detroit's photos use a living, breathing city, to express a prophetic warning of an apocalyptic future, the photos of Devin Optendries, an Alberta photographer, are about architectural space and time. The abandoned spaces that Optendries photographs are primarily in Alberta. Op Optendries' work is reflective and space provoking, while much of Detroit's are flat and meant to be disturbing. Optendries' photographs do not aim to emotionally mourn. Instead, he show shows the ruins and abandoned spaces for what they are. In addition to a visual understanding of spatiality, light, an architectural narrative, he enhances features of the space through light painting, which is a process of applying alternative sources of light to surfaces and extending the exposure time of the camera. 
When asked what it is about abandoned buildings that interests him, he said, the conclusion I have for now is that in our lives, we are always in a constant state of change. Nothing in this world is permanent. I see it as an eerie attachment, almost like being in a graveyard, where it reminds you of where you're at in the world. It helps you to realize that the things that you cherish will pass away, and things that you do will pass away. It's like a ground for me, and that I can go to those places and be reminded that I'm not really a, part, a, a permanent part of the world, and that everything we take pride in is meaningless. It sounds sad to say that, but it's also freeing. It's freeing in that you don't have to worry so much. The realization of time is inherent in architectural ruins. It is a moment of clarity, uh, removing oneself from the now, to reflect on the past and the future in order to better understand the present. Time is borrowed, not infinite. Steel and concrete will eventually come to an end, and so will we. This freeing feeling is much like an inner clarity and sense of peace. As a result, there is often a heightened sense of consciousness of oneself in these spaces. The excitement of exploring the unknown can turn normally automatic responses into conscious decisions. Safety is often a major concern which can influence how one reacts to a space. And in addition to this, the way one engages with the space is completely intuitive. It is no longer about what the building was. It is now a new space to be understood on a personal level. Second only to sight, the next most powerful human sense experienced in these spaces is that of silence. The silent, uh, silent void of humming operating mechanical systems, doors closing and people murmuring is real silence. And it is this real silence that is the most powerful sound that exists. This silence is perhaps the most profound in industrial typologies, since during their original operations, they would have been overwhelmingly loud, but now rest dormant. In the stillness, an individual's awareness of themselves in regards to the space is heightened. They can hear the sound of their breathing, their footsteps, and their heart beating in their chest. Silence is sometimes interrupted by the sounds of nature as it slowly decomposes the buildings. These sounds include the ghostly sounds of owls and pigeons, as well as the dripping of water and the howling of wind. This nature invasion also ties back to the sense of borrowed time. This connection to time of life and death, in combination with a heightened conscious awareness, is what makes these abandoned spaces so compelling. According to Oppenbury's, his creative process in creating a light game involves a personal response to the space, as well as a conscious and controlled application of light that is meant to highlight the important aspects of space, be it structure, or machinery, etc. By controlling the light, often Reese controls the color, shadow, and qualities of the space. He goes beyond the role of a photographer and becomes an artist. The space is inspired, but then he transforms them, makes them his own by complementing the existing. By highlighting certain elements, he creates a subject and a context, adding layers of information. Through this artistic control, we as viewers gain a heightened sense of space and aesthetic of decay in a typical photographic documentation. His photos do not dwell on the past as a lost narrative, but instead highlights what exists as a product of history. The application of light reinvigorates the space, creating an atmosphere outside of the present. His photos are exploratory in nature. Going through his photographic sets as a whole reveals the trek and discovery of an abandoned explorer. In addition to the application of light onto surfaces, Optigris has also created a character to exist in the space. The light painted figure reintroduces human, human scale into the photos. He is anonymous, void of any presuppositions of human character. This allows him to act as a ghostly memory, or perhaps as an otherworldly guide in the space. He represents those who used to inhabit the space, as well as the current urban explorer rediscovering the lost building in the present. Optimus has photographed many abandoned spaces throughout Alberta. As a pilot, he has been afforded the opportunity to scan large areas for hidden treasures. He is now looking to travel outside of Alberta for new abandoned spaces. He doesn't, however, want to photograph Detroit, because he too, feels like now is not the time, because Detroit's ruins carry too much social weight. The ruins of Alberta are far more, are far more disconnected from our time than those of Detroit's. Another interesting character in abandoned architectural space is Gordon Matter Clark. What is interesting today is that his building cuts only exist as photographs, even though at one time, one point in time, there were physical transformations of abandoned spaces. Comparatively with the photographic work of Octodrees, who adds light to enhance the space, Matta Clark is subtracting material in his architectural intervention. Matta Clark's building cuts were related to the building material, context, and architectural space. He used abandoned spaces as the medium by which he could question our current built environment. According to Pamela M. Lee, the author of Object to Be Destroyed, the work of Gordon Matta Clark, the metapsychology of Gordon's art was to embrace the abandoned, 
He worked in old buildings and neighborhoods in a state of rejection. He nurtured a building that had lost its soul. It should be mentioned that his nurturing of a building was not to restore it to a past form, but instead to give new meaning to the building. Day's End by Gordon Matta Clark is a building cut in an outmoded warehouse located on a pier in the lower west side of New York. Set on the waterfront of the Hudson River, the abandoned steel truss and corrugated tin warehouse was chosen by Matta Clark for its cathedral-like interior space and availability. Matta Clark's intervention was based on the sun in circular oval form. There are three primary cuts, uh, the large pointy curve on the west facade, a smaller circle in the top corner, and a curve in the floor which exposed the water of the pier. The west facade cut was the main source of light to the interior, as well as the main signifier of the project to people who approached from the outside. This cut charted the sun through the day. It is said that at the end of the day, the light on the interior was at its most remarkable, hence the name of the project days in. In the vastness of its interior, and uh, quoting me, in the vastness of its interior and its tenuous choreography of shadow and light, a shifting from murky blackness to utter refulgence, the work functioned as a kind of late capitalist pantheon, charting the time of one's experience within the building as measured by the inex inexplorable drift and spread of light across the darkened surfaces. For the sun's passage within day's end was structurally coincided with the building's historical passage into outmodedness, illuminating the twilight of the pier itself. In describing the space as like a cathedral, the light created by the cuts increased the sacral, ed sacral energy of the space. Matta Clark even referred to the large cut in the west facade as a kind of rose window. In contrast to this heightened sacral feeling, there was also a deep association with fear. The large cut in the floor that opened to the water 10 feet below <coughs> was very powerful and frightening. This destructive cut exposed a sort of abyss that left, that viewers, left viewers feeling fearful. This project is particularly interesting because of uh, his attention to time and context. The warehouse maintains its identity, but the spatial character of the interior is enhanced. In the space, in the space, one has a heightened sense of oneself and of time. While time is at the forefront of the experience, the project is also inspired by its context, which can be seen in the choice to remove part of the floor and reveal the fact that the building is in fact over water and not over ground. This not only enhances the psychological experience of the space, but also adds to the understanding of the building as a constructed space, something that Renaissance thinkers were interested in when they looked at their own rooms. To conclude, uh, when we get lost in the nostalgia of our lives, or distracted by the visual shock decay, we lose the ability to understand the spectrum of time and our role within it. We cannot recreate what the building was, so there's no reason to dwell and mourn for it. What we have is a product of the past that can be appreciated for what it is, for what it was, and how it became that way. We can learn from it and let it inform our present and future. Both Octavius and Matta Clark's work show personal reflective thought on the rooms themselves, and their work shows the meaning and power of abandoned spaces. Detroit holds much potential for this kind of reflective creation, which can be seen in projects like the Roosevelt Master Plan. However, it seems that the bewildering visual aesthetic of Detroit's rooms is distracting many years from a deeper understanding. There is no question that abandoned spaces and rooms are a fascinating subject. They are reminders of the past, and prophecies for the future. By acknowledging the passage of time, we remove ourselves from the now to better understand the present. Thank you. state of the room, some of them like in Detroit with the major, the, the, the station, um, is it being maintained as a ruin or being kept alive as a ruin or it's just, is nothing in place to actually tear it down and get rid of it? There's, um, the community is trying to find a new for it, um, but currently there's no, there's nobody uh, tied to keeping it maintained. So it's, it's literally just rotting away. Um, so much of Detroit, because of the, the situation that they found themselves in, um, so much is, is, is abandoned on such a large scale that it's almost too much for one person. And so the Michigan Central Station, not only because of um, the architects who did it, who also did um, Grand Central Station, which is, is a reason to um, appreciate it, um, but it, it's, it's kind of become the face of Detroit, I guess. And 
And so the Roosevelt Master Plan is the closest they come uh, to actually um, restore it would cost uh, so much money that nobody's going to front it uh, yet. Hopefully, uh, <coughs> so currently it's just fenced off from the wire and, and the left kind of Do you see a value in these ruins in actually kind of at the point that they exist, encouraging them to be remain ruins and not be restored or? I think. I think Detroit is an interesting case just because of the, the scale of abandoned architecture. Um, it, it, it's a little overwhelming to kind of imagine how it can kind of be solved. Not that it, it needs to be solved, but it's, it's so uh, widespread. Um, as far as ruins, my personal uh, interest in ruins is how we can maintain, uh, keep their relevancy and I think a lot of what we see with abandoned spaces or historical buildings is this kind of preservation, uh, like a museum, keep it perfect, charge admission, if it's you know, important enough, charge admission, and, and keep it as this kind of object where I think layering uh, information through time and having the ruins take on new forms as time progresses and having uh, the present kind of adopt uh, ruins, uh, I think there's a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. And I, there, there are some interesting projects um, where people have kind of worked within ruins. Um, one project I'm blanking on, on which museum, but it's, it's by Zumthor, where he builds the museum's walls on top of ruins, and the structure of the new, the new walls go through the ruins. So, He's leaving what is a ruin to be a ruin, but he's re-inhabiting the space and kind of filling in the void of, of what was there with a new program and a new space. So that's kind of where my interest is. Thank you. sure that there are any uh, legit tourist um, organizations in Detroit at the moment um, because they are unsafe and, and some of the more interesting spaces are the more uh, dangerous. Um, there are kind of under the table tourist deals, um, but uh, not an official one. Um, but because of Detroit's um, kind of explosion on the world stage in regards to world photography, uh, lots of people are going to see them. And so while they're there, they want to see these kind of ruined spaces and, and kind of imagine, you know, is it the end of the world? Or, you know, what was Michigan Central Station like when it existed? How busy was it? And so, so there's people visiting them, but not. Curiosity, it's going to be hard to keep curiosity out, I guess. Um, but it is in an attempt to kind of reclaim the space around it, and hopefully it will open a discussion for what to, what people can do for the, uh, the central station. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
I guess. Um, this is kind of a, this, so I did this in 2011, kind of first getting into abandoned spaces. And um, I had seen a work, it's, it's a copycat, it's not original, um, uh, a work in Berlin based off of a book that, that I love called uh, Invisible Cities, where they describe um, different cities, but they're not real cities. It's looking at different aspects of what a city is through different uh, factors. And, and the one city, Ursilia, which is what this project was about, um, is about a migrat migratory town that uh, maps strings uh, to kind of better understand the way that they move and, and uh, organize their cities, and they keep abandoning this, the towns and moving on to do it better. And once there's so much string, they keep moving on. And so this this isn't the best photo of, of the string that we did. Um, I chose this photo um, for other reasons, but um, we there's a abandoned building in Alberta that we went through, and we took string through all of the movement spaces and from uh, emerging objects, and just created kind of a, a network within it based on based on that. So it's just a another way to kind of be in the space and look at, at, at the space more critically, movement and stuff like that. 